In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on tactics. Chaplain's Report today does continue in our book, uh, in our study of 1 Samuel. And for those of you who may not have seen the most recent episode, we've been talking a lot about this episode that happens in Samuel 15. So what happens is God gives Saul a correct, uh, a correct, a direct command, I almost mixed my words together there, to destroy the Amalekites, their livestock, their royalty, everything. They're supposed to be completely destroyed, no spoil taken. They're not supposed to take their jewelry or anything else, destroy the entire people, wipe them off the map, and then come home. So Saul doesn't do that, unfortunately, because that's become par for the course for Saul, unfortunately, over the past several chapters, is that Saul has a tendency to not do what God asked him to do. And here we see Saul do the same thing again. He destroys most of the people, but he keeps the livestock, and he also keeps King Agag alive, even though he was not supposed to. And so this is what happens, and in, in this is where we pick it up in 1 Samuel 15, verses 24 through 26, where he says, Then Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned, I have indeed transgressed the command of the Lord and your words, because I feared the people and listened to their voice. Now therefore, please pardon my sin and return with me, that I might worship the Lord. But, the, but Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of the Lord, and the Lord has rejected you from being king over Israel. This is a pretty difficult moment for Saul. But at least Saul finally admits to doing wrong. Because if you've watched the past several episodes, if you've seen, if you've read through the past several verses, you know that Saul has denied any wrongdoing. First, he basically tried to hide the fact that he sinned, which didn't work out. And then after he had been found out, he said, okay, well, yeah, technically I may not have 100% followed God's command to the letter of it, but it was because I was trying to do the right thing and I wanted to make sacrifices to God, and uh, really the people made me do it. Now Saul is finally saying, you know what? I screwed up. I sinned. I didn't do the right thing. I listened to the word of the people instead of the word of God. I'm sorry. So it took him a while, but he did finally get to that place where he has admitted that he has sinned. But my question here is, is he truly sorry? Is he sorry that he did the wrong thing, or is he sorry that he got caught? Because to be honest, it seems to me a lot more like the latter. And remember that Saul wasn't always like this. There were a lot of times in the earlier part of Saul's reign that he's the person that that brings Israel together, that, that starts the long process of casting out the Philistines. I mean, there's a lot of good in Saul's resume, but that doesn't matter because God is concerned with what we're doing now and what we're going to do in the future. Now, that works out really well for us in a lot of ways because that also means that God is capable of forgiving our past sins, which far outweigh any good deeds that we've done. But that's what God is primarily concerned with. And Saul has messed this up. Now, he's finally at least admitted to it. But it seems as though this isn't the most sincere apology. And part of the reason that I bring that up is because we didn't read this particular verse, but a little bit later in the same passage, Saul basically begs Samuel to come back with him, he says, so that the, the other people won't despise me. Even after all this, even after he specifically tried to blame what he did by saving the livestock on the people and saying, even in this verse, I have sinned because I heeded the words of the people instead of God. I have sinned because I have transgressed the commandment of the, the word because I feared what people thought. He still hasn't learned his lesson. Because just a couple verses later, he says, you know what, Samuel, you need to come back with me because I'm really concerned what other people are going to think. 
it's like he can't help himself. He can't get out of this mindset of wanting to please people rather than God. And that's why I say I'm not sure that this is a altogether real confession, a real admission of guilt and doing the wrong thing, because it kind of seems like if Saul were given the option of doing it all over again, he'd have done the same thing, which is the opposite of biblical repentance. Repentance means to turn around and to do differently than you would before. All we're seeing here is that Saul still cares way too much what other people think about him and doesn't care nearly enough what God thinks about him. And to that end, why wouldn't God forgive Saul here? I think that's the reason. Because God can see into the heart. I mean, looking at it from a human perspective, you almost feel sorry for Saul in this moment, going, well, Saul did say he was sorry. Saul did ask for forgiveness. But we have to remember that we're not God. We do have the advantage of hindsight, though. And we can see how Saul acts after this. Not only with what I just described with him still being way too concerned about what other people thought about him, but also the way that he interacts with David, the way that he interacts with Jonathan. God gets to see all that before it happens. He knows that Saul's heart has not changed. He can see that already. And we have to remember that he can see it with us. Sometimes even when we ask for forgiveness of sins, and this is something that is highly, highly personable, personal to me, even if we mean it in the moment, even if we are crying out to God and begging Him to forgive us and to help give us the strength to do better next time and to not fall into this kind of sin or temptation again, and then we find ourselves, you know, maybe just an hour later involved in exactly the same thing. How real was that confession? How real was that plea for forgiveness? And see, God knows that ahead of time, too. He knows who we are, and He sees into our heart. And so I, I get so frustrated with people that say, well, as long as you're sincere about your faith, then you're okay with God. No. Maybe Saul in the moment was super sincere here. It didn't change the fact that he was not willing to make the difficult decisions and the tough changes later on that would have merited a true repentance here. This is not a true repentance because he doesn't change his ways. And the same holds true for us. If we don't change our sinful ways then we can't call what we're doing actually repenting. We're saying some words and asking for forgiveness, but we're not actually putting in the work to have repented. And another thing that's important to remember here is that forgiveness does not mean freedom from the consequences of your actions. Maybe God did forgive him here, I don't know. But it's also possible that God forgave him for his sin right here, but also said, okay, well, I do forgive you of your sin, but that doesn't mean that you're not going to fall prey to the consequences of your own actions. Your sins do have worldly consequences. So even if God completely forgave Saul of his sin right here, that doesn't mean that he still wasn't going to take the throne away from him. By the way, we see this with his successor as well. You remember that David, even though God said to David that you have been forgiven in the incident with Bathsheba, for years, David still had to pay for the consequences of his own sin. There were ramifications and ripple effects that took place because of what David did. And even though God himself had forgiven him and told him that he was forgiven, that didn't mean that he still didn't suffer negative consequences because of the actions that he had taken. And Saul is about to experience the same thing. Maybe, again, in this instance, he is sincere, and, and maybe God has even forgiven him. That doesn't mean that you are all of a sudden immune to all of the worldly consequences of the bad decisions that you have made. And that doesn't mean that you can't come back and be spiritually stronger and even be right with God and, and go on to lead a godly life and eventually be with him in heaven if you're in a similar situation to this. But that doesn't mean that you all of a sudden are off the hook and none of the bad decisions that you've made are going to come back to bite you. Let's say, for example, you're, I don't know, a drug addict or an alcoholic of some kind, and you ruin your relationship with your kids. But then, years later, you come to find Jesus, you clean up your act, you're no longer engaged in that sin or letting that sin become your idol, and, and uh, that's no longer a problem for you. 
That doesn't mean your relationship with your kids, you don't get that back. You don't get to take those things back and there are still real world consequences. Even if God forgives you, it doesn't mean that there aren't going to be consequences for our actions. So then the question becomes, why is it that Saul was at this point unfit to lead? He was not able to be a king after this point. And Samuel tells him in no uncertain terms that that is going to be the result of his disobedience. You see, this isn't just a failure on a personal level. This is a failure as a king. As horrible as what David did with Bathsheba, in a lot of ways that was a personal sin. In a lot of ways what David did there, yes, it did affect Israel, and and that can't be overlooked. But in a lot of ways that was a personal sin against Uriah. It wasn't as though David actively defied God's orders with Israel. Now, he actually does do that later with the census uh, in a less direct way. But here, Saul was given a direct command by God, and he is charged with leading God's people to be closer to him. And what does Saul do instead? Not what God told him to. And what was the way that he reached that point? Because the people called out to him and he feared the people by his own admission. So at this point, Saul is no fit, no longer fit to be the leader of Israel. Just like us. I mean, if we are in a leadership position, whether it's in our church or in our families or whatever else it is, then we can find ourselves in a similar situation where we make a, a, a decision that doesn't just affect us, but leads people that we are charged with in the wrong way. And that's serious. And it also means that we can actually have our leadership removed from us, just like Saul did here. That's why we have to stay vigilant to make sure that no matter what we do, obedience is always the first priority. That no matter what other people want, no matter what other people say, no matter what the world tells us to do, that ultimately we have one master and we obey him to the letter of the law, period. Stay the course, friends. <laughs> So now they have this fancy new technology where you click on one of these boxes and it takes you to another one of my videos. Hopefully it works a lot better than the Obamacare website or the DNC's Iowa caucus app. Gotta love that big government central planning.